Happy Pride Month, everyone! It's a great time of the year for Rainbow Whoppers, Rainbow Vaseline, and of course, Rainbow Ew. But what I'm talking about today is unfortunately not gay at all. And it's also not prideful. In fact, I would say it's shameful. They should rename this book Shameful. It's called Credence. Have you heard of it? If your answer is no, nice, very nice. But if you or a loved one has read Credence, you might be entitled to financial compensation. I started reading this like three months ago, but I had to take a huge break at about 200 pages because I thought I actually might flatline. Credence was written by best-selling author Penelope Douglas, and it has over 331,000 reviews on Goodreads alone, which is actually scary, like scarier than Ollie London looks because this book contains as follows in pedia rednecks e-bikes but all of this is just supposed to be spicy like a little spicy book talk book oh my god did you read that did you read that book yet credence is about a 17 year old girl named Tyrion dehas and i may or may not be saying that name wrong but in due time you'll see why i cannot be bothered to correct myself the book begins with Tyrion dealing with the aftermath of her ultra famous movie star parents committing dual together. Yes, crazy ass sentence, I know. But the lore is that Tiernan's mom and dad were so in love with each other that they regretted ever having her. And this caused them to emotionally neglect her in various ways, such as not inviting her to famous people haberdasheries and kind of just ignoring her at home. And so on this day of their death, Tiernan doesn't really have a reaction to this just because she had already emotionally distanced herself from this relationship. Now, I personally visualized Tiernan's parents as Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox, simply because one of the biggest problems was that they matched each other's freak too much. And so, I'll be using this picture to represent them. In the following pages, we learn that the catalyst for them to end their lives was that Tiernan's dad had terminal cancer, and so rather than live without him, they both just ended it. All of that, and they didn't even leave her a note. Next, let's talk about Murai. Murai is the family housekeeper, as well as Tiernan's mom's assistant, and she is the only person who does care about Tiernan in this entire book, with an asterisk, of course, because on this very day of death, Murai offers to spend the night in the house with Tiernan, but Tiernan's like, no, 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 it's good, it's good, I'm fine, I'm fine. And for some reason, she believes her? Like, Dude, this child needs a Kane's three finger combo and a YouTube video stat. And side note, isn't it kind of interesting that the only person of color in this whole book is a housekeeper? Penelope, you son of a bitch. With that being said, the plot so far was actually pretty interesting to me, and I felt that Tiernan had the potential to be a fascinating character. I mean, there's just so much you can do with this storyline, which really makes it such a shame that in the following chapters, we get spoon-fed some diabolical dookie that completely overrides any shadow of a f Later that night, Tiernan gets a phone call from an unknown distant relative named Uncle Jake, full government name Jake Vanderberg. And basically, he is the stepbrother of her newly deceased father, Hans. And he's like, hello, um, your parents listed me as your legal guardiana if the circumstances were to ever arise. Rise. And he goes on to say, like, listen up, kid. I live with my two sons in Colorado in the middle of nowhere, and you're almost 18, so I'm not gonna, like, 
force you to come over here, but you can if you want to. And Tiernan makes the hasty decision within a few hours that, hey, I'm gonna actually try to go live with these people and meet them because they're my family. And for some reason, is just like, yeah, dude, go for it. Go live with these three men who you've never met before in your life and are gonna be living with them in the wilderness. But before we talk more about the brain rot that is this book, let's talk about something that is actually good for your brain. Straight Arrow News is a website and app that's dedicated to getting you the truth. We live in a time where we're just so overwhelmed with information that we sometimes lose track of what's what and where it's coming from, whether it be news about tech, business, international news, or just politics in general. So something I really appreciate about Straight Arrow News is the organization and effort that they've made to make things as transparent as possible. If you head over to their opinion section, they tell you if these articles were written by somebody who is left-leaning or right-leaning. So you can go into it already knowing their angle or bias. I am personally on the left spectrum, so I've been really appreciating the coverage that Adrian Lawrence and Dr. Rashad Ritchie have been doing. They both have great video libraries and they explain things in a very accessible way. Now, I think Straight Arrow News is really important because if people are able to see the way of Others in media are discussing things on either end of the political spectrum, then they themselves might be able to tackle these subjects in a more informed way. And knowing the way that the opposite side thinks allows room for real meaningful conversations about politics. They also have a media miss category that covers news that nobody else is really reporting on, which is great because then you can discover reporting that you're not seeing from bias mainstream media outlets. Hence, the miss. Go to sand.com slash Nikki and check it out for yourself. You can visit my link or download the app. And if you do, you're not only supporting me, but also a free news platform that's raising the bar for journalism and getting you the truth. Thank you so much for sponsoring me, Straight Arrow News. And now back to the video. Welcome back. Okay, so Tiernan flies to Colorado, right? And this is where she meets Uncle Jake for the first time. And so right away from Tiernan's point of view, he's established as being a very attractive man. He's described as six foot two, athletic with short cropped dark blonde hair and blue eyes. So basically Sawyer from Lost, but probably more racist. Peace and love to the actor who plays Sawyer. Um, He does not deserve to be roped into this, but he will be the visual representation of Jake nonetheless. And just right off the bat, this guy is cringe as fuck. Like, one of the first things he says to Tiernan is accuse her of liking caramel macchiatos because she's from California. And she's like, um, sir, her parents just died? You get to drink 10 beers in a day and use five in one fucking shampoo and nobody tells you anything about it. But Tiernan's like, I don't drink caramel caramel macchiatos, you know, Senorita Awesome Coded. Those white girl pumpkin spice lattes annoy me. I'm in love. <laughs> when she initially arrives to Jake's house, there's like a sense of freedom that floods her. Like, okay, I can just be out in nature. I don't have to think about my parents. I don't have to deal with the press because once again, they were like really famous. And it's in sections of the book like this where I feel like Penelope Douglas actually shows that she kind of is a competent writer. Like, just for an example, here's a quick passage about Tiernan enjoying nature. In the distance, in perfect view between the trees, beyond the balcony, stands a mountain, its granite peak gray and foreboding, skirted with green pines and topped with white clouds that make the scene so beautiful, I stop breathing. Holy shit, it's just there, a cathedral, sitting in front of a blue sky, and before I can stop myself, I raise my hand, reaching for it like I want to take it in my fist. But all I can feel 
is the morning air breeze through my fingers. This honestly makes me feel like Penelope Douglas might just be like a right wing grifter, but like of the book world, if that makes sense. Because there's so much money that you can make off of these like weird, creepy, fetish book talk books. And she might have just seen a bag and was like, okay, I'm gonna get it. But either way, low key, I kind of think somebody should check her hard drive. And we'll get into that in a second. But back to Tiernan's first night at Uncle Jake's house. So she notices a early 20s looking woman leaving Jake's bedroom. And this will be an unfortunate recurring theme because all three of the Vanderberg boys are like ladies men. She also meets one of Jake's sons, cousin Noah. And now Noah is actually supposed to be the softy out of the two brothers. But I'm just gonna tell you already, in reality, he is bare minimum creepy. But anyways, he's 20 years old, he has blue eyes and blonde hair, and if he was real, he would probably have a picture of himself holding up a giant fish on Bumble. Now, Noah's whole lore is that he wants to leave this small town and go explore the world like really badly, but his dad is adamant that he stays here and helps out with their farm. He's also really good at motocross, but his dad is constantly like berating him to stop and like telling him that's not a real career. Like Jake really gives some Troy Bolton's dad, like high school musical dad vibes. Tiernan also notices that Noah is very attractive and he basically looks like a mini version of Jake. And at this point, Tiernan still hasn't met her other cousin, Caleb, but Noah and Jake both warn her that he's very standoffish and he actually doesn't talk at all to anyone. Anyone. So don't take it personally if he's not very like receptive to anything you say. The following day, Jake starts teaching Tiernan how to ride on a horseback and she immediately feels like there's sort of like a weird tension between them. Even as they're just riding the same horse, he's holding on to the reins and like his arms are kind of touching her thighs. And um, is now a good time to mention that Jake is over the age of 40? Um, what the sigma? Sorry. Also something to note, right away there is a very pungent stink of misogyny in the Vanderberg house. Like, woo, that is stinky. It stinks in here. Jake assigns her to kitchen duty and says, burn the bacon, Tiernan. Me and the boys like it that way. His excuse for this is that they need to all get work done at the barn and they don't have time for this, which begs the question, how the fuck did they eat before Tiernan moved here. In the following days, Tiernan notices that Jake has a tattoo that says, My Mexico. And what is the lore behind that tattoo, you might be asking? It's something very stupid, we'll get to it in a second. But things start escalating between her and Jake pretty quickly. I mean, literally on day three, Tiernan gets a splinter in her finger and Jake uses his mouth to suck it out. Okay, have you ever heard of tweezers? Tweezers, my love. But anyways, no one brings his motocross friends up to the house and right away him and Jake have this whole sentiment of like do not talk to the local boys there are nothing but trouble as well as telling her that she needs to dress appropriately which is all really funny because the call is so coming from inside the house um Noah also starts flirting with Tiernan pretty obnoxiously like he says things like you have a pretty smile cuz if you stay I'll make you smile some more. Another example is, come over here. I don't buy my little cousin at least. We switch to Jake's point of view in the next chapter and of course he's already really creepy saying weird shit like if I were a worse man you bet your bottom dollar I would do something. He also gets a call from Mirai and is insanely rude for no reason. I'd like her to come home. I can't make her and she'll probably be angry I'm talking to you, but... But... I want to be there for her. I'm worried everything building up inside of her will eventually spill over. Spill over? Who is this woman? What arrogance to think I can't handle this? I mean, I can't. 
but she doesn't know that. What the hell? You think you can raise this underaged minor that I've known for three days and am attracted to better than me? Cool story, babe. Now go make me a sandwich. He also acknowledges that Tiernan is a kid in his own inner thoughts. He says things like, maybe this is exactly what this kid needs. And it's kind of crazy that he just self-reports himself like that. Anyways, Noah takes Tiernan up to the local drugstore and this is where we meet an op named Cece Diggins. And Cece is basically a jealous girl that feels threatened by Tiernan because A, she's pretty and B, she's living in the same house as Caleb who you'll learn she is in love with. And she's especially pissed about this because the Vanderberg's house is in such a high area that it actually gets snowed in for the entirety of the winter, which is around like three months, I think. And so the fact that she's the only woman in that house has her like enraged. I mean, I don't know why she feels this way because this is their cousin. I guess in the end she was right, but I mean, the fact that she's jealous of his cousin leads me to believe that this is normal behavior for the area. But this is when hater number two, Terrence Halcombe, enters the chat. Noah describes this guy as an up and coming motocross star. And this is a man in his early 20s, mind you. Like there's not a single carny in this town that isn't a fucking freak. Colorado, more like Freaky Rado. But later that night, Tiernan finally meets Caleb in the worst, air quotes, meet cute you could ever imagine. So she hears something in the middle of the night stirring in their basement. So she gets up, creeps over there, do, 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 opens the door and sees Caleb peeling a deer like it's a orange. He has blood all over him and he's glaring at her menacingly. That is, right before he launches at her, attacks her, and attempts to her. And the only thing that stops him from doing that is Noah coming down and finding this scene. And he immediately goes, dude, she's not a townie. You can't do that. The connotation being that it's okay to do that to the local girls, just not our cousin. And so the tea of it all is that Caleb is 21 years old and he hasn't talked to anybody since he was four years old due to mysterious circumstances that no one wants to talk to Tiernan about. Cringe, to be honest. I hate stories where dudes have one really bad thing happen to them, and so they get a free pass to be a piece of shit for the rest of their lives. That's just literature reflecting reality though, I guess. She goes to bed after this horrible altercation and wakes up to discover that she's covered in the deer's blood from last night. Very cool and very hot. Yeehaw, I love this book. Wow. Tiernan makes breakfast for all four of them, but doesn't say anything about the assault. And to just twist the knife on that whole situation, Caleb ignores her completely and takes the stack of pancakes that she left on the table and distributes them to everyone except for her. And that's basically his attitude for the rest of the book. He goes out of his way Way to treat her like shit any chance he gets. Another great example of this is when Noah invites her to ride on his bike with him on the trail, and as he's passing turn in the helmet, Caleb slaps it out of her hands, and this makes her cry and run away, and Jake, his fucking dad, witnesses this, by the way, and just doesn't say anything, fucking father of the year over here, let's all crap on the orphaned girl, like, woo! Everybody get up. And after that bullying incident, she goes to a lake by herself and just swims in there trying to relax after all these dudes are just so crappy to her. But unfortunately, Terrence Halcombe has been stalking her ever since their first interaction. So he shows up and he gets in the lake and starts hitting on her like, hey mamas. She rejects him, but he grabs her and tries to kiss her. Like I said, every single carny in this town is uncivilized. 
paralyzed. Right as this is about to happen, though, Caleb and Noah show up on their bikes to her rescue, and Caleb just straight up pulls a Glock out of his pants. What's happening? Why do you have that? Um, but this allows for Tiernan and Noah to bicycle away. But not before Terrence ominously says, see you again. <laughs> when Caleb gets back to the house, he has very clearly been beaten to a bloody pulp. Tiernan rightfully confronts him and is like, you didn't do that for my honor. You did that just because you're a hothead. You don't actually care about me. You just wanted to start beef with that freaking guy. But Jake can't handle this. He can't handle his stupid little boy getting any kind of uh, feedback. And so he loses his mind and he goes on this absolutely cruel rant to Tiernan where he's just calling her a spoiled brat, calling her lazy, she's selfish, her life is sad and hollow. Like so many things just out of pocket and unwarranted. And so she runs to her room crying, right? And a couple hours later, someone mysteriously leaves a bag of candy at her door. And there's a little note attached to it that says, your parents never gave you anything sweet and that's why you aren't. I literally don't understand in what world, universe, continent, this is an apology, but okay. And it isn't stated who left this this mess of an apology there, but it's alluded later on that it was Caleb. And speaking of apologies, the next day Jake gives a very half-assed one. Like the only thing that he says to Tiernan is, you're not alone. Everyone's going through something, Tiernan. Um, I'm sorry, did your f parents just commit s together and not leave you a note? Because if they didn't, then get in your car and floor it off of the Grand Canyon. I don't want to hear blah, 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 blah. I don't want to hear any of this. You are not the same. But aside from his air quotes apology, he ends up dumping some lore on us that is essential to understanding why he is a piece of shit. So here's what we learn. First, that Noah and Caleb's mom is in prison. Number two, that Jake grew up under the rich conditions, very similar to Tiernan, of course, because he's her uncle. It kind of makes sense that they both grew up rich. Hello, it's the same family. But he grew to resent that lifestyle after something very traumatic happened to them. So here's where it gets juicy and convoluted. When Jake was 18 years old, he met the love of his life and her name was Flora. And she was a Mexican immigrant and her and her family did not have very much money. This was to the dismay of his family because they're all rich and uppity uppity. And his stepbrother, aka Tiernan's dad, had started this relationship with Tiernan's mom, who was this rising starlet. Like she was getting famous, she was getting rich. And so the whole family, including them, formulated this plan that, by the way, I'm so sorry that I keep calling Tiernan's mom and dad just Tiernan's mom and Tiernan's dad. I tried to look back a bunch of times. I can't remember what their names were. But anyways, Tiernan's mom and dad have this plan to get Flora drunk drunk as hell and then put her in Tiernan's dad's bed so that when she wakes up, she thinks that they slept together and that she's cheated on Jake. So they do this little plan and Flora is so humiliated and ashamed that she flees town and Jake's family then pays her $50,000 to never show up ever again. Now from Tiernan's point of view, when she hears this, She's confused why her mom would participate in this whole thing because she also grew up poor. And like, I was hoping at some point or at the end of the book, there would be some kind of revelation about this. Like, oh, like her mom wasn't actually involved in this or just something would happen with that, but it never does. This never gets brought up again. Real missed opportunity. But anyways, so Jake goes on to say that he went looking for Flora and he found her in in some apartment in San Francisco. By the way, San Francisco's a very expensive place to live. Like, Flora was kind of low-key balling for a second there. But anyways, he shows 
up okay she answers the door she can't even look at him in the eye she's so ashamed that she's cheated on him and so jake leaves i guess and then the next day he finds out through a phone call from her sister that flora has killed herself and the bottom line is that his tattoo that says my mexico is in dedication to her and as a mexican myself i would find this tattoo to be very odd like i would find it very very odd if somebody got this for me. In the following chapter, we get some more insight into Tiernan's like state of mind throughout her troubled childhood. And she details an incident where she actually tried to kill herself by walking into the ocean with a book bag filled with books and trying to get herself to sink. And um, that's messed up obviously but noah's reaction in his mind is to instantly sexualize her he's like what if i had sex with my cousin just once just would it really be that bad moving on though we're gonna skip ahead multiple multiple chapters because this book is over 500 pages long which is way too many pages for what it is. But Tiernan goes swimming in this cove with all three of the Vanderberg boys and she swims up to a little cave and she hears like a woman screaming in there and saying like, no! And approaching a little closer, she realizes that this person is Cece Diggins. She swims out and Tiernan's like, whoa, what did Caleb do to Cece Diggins? Tiernan doesn't tell anybody about this incident Incident, but it's very obvious that something happened there and like are we surprised by that? I actually think it's really really interesting that CC Diggins is considered a villain in this book but Jake, Noah, or Caleb aren't. Tiernan and Jake's relationship escalates once again unfortunately to another new inappropriate level. One night when the boys are upstairs having sex with Tam Townies, as they call them. Tiernan's down in the kitchen. She's minding her own business. She's making some girl dinner, eggs in a pan at 9 p.m. in your underwear type beat. And she's completely unaware that Jake, nasty old little Jake, is in the shadows watching her like ooh, ooh. once she notices him she's like hey because you know it's not her job not to flirt with him okay she's the minor and jake starts asking her some severely creepy dementia amnesia bed rot crock pot pee pee poop what am i saying and jake starts asking her some severely creepy stuff like have you ever been kissed before and have you ever had a man in your bed before and this tension between them is building is building and they start making out jake starts running from first base to second base to third base he's trying to like take it there with his freaking niece like Ew. But right as they're about to take it even further, he goes, wait, 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 no, 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 no. I couldn't possibly. And his reasoning for this is that if they were to have right now, it would be because Tiernan's acting out since her parents died and she just wants anyone to love her. <clears throat> I'm lonely and an emotionally stunted child. And you're the first woman I've been around long enough to get connected to in the past 20 years. He stands up straight, running a hand through his hair. And you're just a neglected orphan, desperate for attention. That's all this is. Way to try to take the blame off of you and treat this as if you guys are both on equal footing and both adults. But this shitty explanation clearly worked on her because 10 pages later, she says, We're both lonely and we act it out. I need family more than I need and going through with what we were doing last night would have complicated everything. He was right to stop it. The whole we're both this and we're both that, like go ahead and subtract yourself from that, honey, because this guy is way too old to be making excuses for this. But something else you really need to know is that Noah and Caleb are both insanely rude, like individually, but together they create a cataclysmic freaky quake. Like not even something as benign as ordering cheeseburgers with them can just be 
normal and non-toxic. Like, they're about as non-toxic as asbestos. Because when they pull up to this drive-thru, let's just say it's fucking Whataburger because I hate Whataburger. They do a spiritual attack on this Whataburger employee, all just because she tries to talk to Caleb. She says, just so you know, your offer still stands. She's looking at Caleb and she hands Noah the bags of food. You sure you don't want to tuck me away up to the peak? with the rest of the necessities you need for winter. I could keep, I could keep you warm. <laughs> and in response, Noah says, yeah, only if he puts you back in the pantry the other 23 hours of the day that he's not using you. She rightfully throws a drink in Noah's face and they make a speedy getaway that's supposed to be so fun and silly. But like, no, you should eat dirt and worms for breakfast. Why would him being rude as fuck to a minimum wage worker be depicted as like charming and quirky. Moving on though, Tiernan's 18th birthday comes up and a plethora of important things happen. Well, important is a strong word for this, but you do need to know it. So listen up class. They go out to a birthday dinner. Let's just say it's Fuddruckers because that sounds like a very Colorado coated restaurant. And they're sitting in their booth. They're waiting to order some food. Meanwhile, Tiernan is going through the pictures on her phone and she stumbles across one of her in Vanity Fair. Now, this Vanity Fair picture is very provocative, especially for the age that she had to have taken it at. Like, she's in a push-up bra. Um, the spread that this was included in was supposed to be about the lives of celebrity children. And while it's not hard to believe at all that a big publication would put out a gross picture of a minor, it's a little bit shocking reading this from Penelope Douglas because I thought she would at least draw the line at sexualizing a 17 year old. But she's like, nah, 16 would be very cool and interesting as well. But anyways, Noah sees this picture and he rips her phone out of her hands and he's like, do you want to look like this on our website? To provide some context for that, the Vanderberg business is fixing up motocross bikes. I haven't mentioned it because 99% of the time it's irrelevant. But just keep that in mind because it does come up one more time. When Noah suggests this, of course Tiernan's like, shut up, come on. But he keeps pressuring her and he says things like, come on, what do all the other shops have that we don't? Something to look at. And Tiernan in her mind is like, hmm, should I? Other than that, Caleb actually does something nice for once. Not that it matters, but he gives her a handmade brown belt with intricate carvings on it. And Tiernan actually ends up hyper fixating on this and being like, wow, this is so thoughtful. I can't believe he spent so many hours on this just for me. Tiernan, stop. Get behind me right now. After dinner, they head over to a bar and Jake tells the bartender to serve Tiernan even though she's underage. Because fuck it, why not? Let's add to the growing list of crimes, please. But Tiernan goes off, she starts doing her own thing, she's dancing in a crowd of girls, having fun, getting a little silly and drunk. Meanwhile, all three of the Vanderberg boys, the dark triad, have you, are staring at her with their mouths agape. Oh! and their eyes popping out of their head with hearts like a cartoon wooga. Cousin love the house boots down. But she gets so entranced with having fun and dancing with these girls that when the song ends, she realizes that she can't see any of the boys anymore and she's been in fact surrounded by ops, including Cece Diggins and Terrence Halcombe. And this whole ambush is really, really stupid. But the the following discourse is actually really important, so I'm going to read a lot of it to you verbatim. So Cece has her hands around Tiernan's hips, and she's like, What if I told you that Caleb did hit me in the cave that day? Would you still want to spend the winter locked away on the peak with him? I pause, stunned. What? And what if I told you, Cece continues, tracing the spaghetti strap of my dress, that he can't wait to make you bleed too and he's just biding his time until you have no means of escaping him and this is Tiernan's inner monologue she goes 
Caleb, Caleb isn't like that. Yes, he is. Um, but Terrence chimes in and he goes, they warned you about me, didn't they? You should have been warned about them. They only wanted you because you're rich and beautiful. Think about what your money will do for the Vanderberg extreme and what your body will do in their beds. And now you're 18, Terrence adds, perfectly legal in all 50 states, just in time for the snow. They don't really like you, Cece tells me. You're useful, just like the rest of us who service them. She rubs circles on my belly as her head remains on my shoulder. And when they fuck you pregnant, they'll control you and your bank account forever. The boys finally realize what's going on at this point and a huge fight breaks out in the bar. Like there's glasses breaking, there's pool sticks snapping, you know. All bubble blowing babies will be beaten senselessly by every able pardon in the bar. You know, they grab her, they rush her into the truck. And in the midst of all this, Terrence, Cece, and company start chasing them and they're like waving their hands in the air like, why I oughta? And Caleb only makes this situation worse by getting in the driver's seat and flooring it so he runs over all of their motocross bikes. The Vanderbergs truck starts speeding away, but Terrence and Cece plus all of their other little motocross buddies hurry up to gather their bikes off off of the ground and chase after them on a snowy hill. And what makes matters worse is that they see cop lights joining in on this chase because they're hella speeding. And all of this racing causes their car to fishtail. And I would love to tell you right now that this resulted in a life-altering car accident in which all of them died except for Tiernan. But unfortunately, that is not the case and they make it home safely and the Vanderberg boys are like hip hip hooray because they live in this rural house where no one not even the cops can really get to them right now so they're pretty much done with it got away with it all scotch free this same night though Jake goes to bed early and some hog wild shit happens like how do I even delicately put this on God's youtube.com I'm just gonna say it basically Caleb and no Noah start watching porn together in the living room of all places, by the way, and jerking it. They're not beating the incest allegations anytime soon. And to make matters worse for me, the reader, Tiernan also starts jerking it. And by the way, the porn that they're watching is sexy cop related. Can I get a blech, ladies? Blech. I would literally rather project images of my butthole onto the Empire State Building than watch porn about cops. Anyways, though, eventually Noah starts f***ing her and doing other little things on her. Meanwhile, Caleb is just standing there ominously watching them. And Noah warns her that he's gonna get her you know what, and Caleb is gonna get Get her butt. Which, um, under no circumstances are these words that you want to hear unless you're on the operating table with Dr. Miami. But just as they're about to take it further, Jake comes downstairs and is like, hey, what are you doing? And Noah's response to this is, nothing she doesn't want. Yikes, guys, I am so scared. Am I shit posting on main right now by posting about this book? And in case you're wondering, from Tiernan's point of view, she's thinking, given our familial ties, this is wrong. I can see how people might think this is wrong. Oh, really? You could see how people might they might think it's wrong. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad we could all see that. But Jake is yelling at her about this. He's like, what would have happened if I didn't come down? What did you want to happen? And Tiernan says she wanted everything to happen because she's feeling very overwhelmed by how all three of them have been looking at her like Goo Goo Gaga this whole week. I mean, my brother in Christ, Jake, this is the environment that you fostered. But to punish her for having the the audacity of being taken advantage by a different family member, Jake starts spanking her. And there's nothing else of value to say about this, so next chapter. This one is from Jake's point of view, and he's shamelessly jealous of his sons for making moves on his niece, both internally and externally. They don't love her. Sure, they're attracted to her, probably more than any woman, but Noah isn't serious about any 
anything, and Caleb doesn't let anybody in. Really, really loving this familial love triangle. I'm really proud of humanity right now. But all four of them end up going hunting, of course, because there's a very limited amount of time before the snow reaches maximum cleanliness, and they have to have enough protein to last all winter. They're not like you, where they can just drink caramel macchiatos and avocado toast and senorita awesome. Name? Senorita Awesome. The boys are both very much used to this, but for some reason, Jake specifically pressures Tiernan into killing a deer herself. Despite her crying and expressing that she definitely does not want to kill anything. Hmm, I wonder why this teenager wouldn't want to be confronted with death. Hmm, I really do wonder. But after enough coaxing, she finally does end up pulling the trigger. So Noah and Caleb go out into the forest to find this deer and pick him up. Meanwhile, Tiernan and Jake start getting in a fight because she only did that to impress him like she truly did not want to kill that deer and so she ends up saying she hates him. My parents sent me to you because they hated me. They wanted me to suffer and you were the worst that they could do to me. And in response, Jake says, maybe they felt bad about what they took from me so they gave me you. I grip the back of her scalp and I pull her up to my mouth. A payment of their debt. That's what you are, Tiernan. A f payment. The connotation being that her parents donated her for him to f So, to my reading displeasure, they start making out and grinding against each other. And when they hear the boys coming back with the deer, he's like, hurry up, get in the truck. And like, he's all disheveled looking. And so he's like, hey, how about you guys take that deer, put it into your truck, take it home, start the deboning process, take your time, okay? And me and Tiernan will be right behind you, okay? Well, we're we're gonna be there. Trust, don't, you don't have to look. You don't have to check if we are arriving at the same time. We will. Don't worry about it. And so the boys drive away and what follows is the most porn rotted shit I've ever read. And before I proceed, I really need you guys to know my stance on something, so listen up, class. If you watch barely legal p as an adult, I literally think you should get the guillotine. I literally think you should get chopped chop 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 and this is basically the fictitious literature version of that like i just really really think that we as a society should desexualize minors and 18 year olds and stuff like this really isn't helping in my opinion don't come for me in the comments you're only gonna make yourself look yucky because this whole thing is so so creepy penelope douglas literally writes about how tiernan's hair is in pig Tales? Like, first of all, red fucking flag. If the author goes out of their way to write that, just red flag. And it's not even just that. Like, Penelope writes about how her chair hasn't been broken yet. And there's even some text later on in the book that is just, let me just read it to you. Nothing can really prepare you for this line, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go for it. If he weren't looking at a woman's body, he might think a child was speaking to him with how innocent and and sweet she sounded. <coughs> It's all just very suspicious. I feel like as a writer and a reader alike, if your fantasy couldn't survive the protagonist being one year younger, it's time to pack it up. I don't have much more to say about this car scene with Jake other than, you know, he's a creep and he literally brings up her dead parents while they're having sex. He's like, oh, they left me a nice piece of ass. Like, excuse me? Oh yeah, and on top of it all, he doesn't use protection, like not him being the most diabolical unk of history. But in the following chapter, they drive back to the house and Jake starts rationalizing what he's done by saying, well, at least she didn't lose her virginity to Terrence Halcombe or some other boy that doesn't even care about her. Do you really care about her, Jake? <laughs> Tiernan unfortunately seems to think so because she thinks 
thanks him for being so nice and making everything so perfect, which perfect is a strong word when you're talking about having sex in a crusty truck that smells like Cool Ranch Doritos and feet probably. But they finally open up the front door of the house, they walk in, and it's immediately very clear to Noah and Caleb that the two of them just screwed. Like her shirt is partially unbuttoned and his is fully unbuttoned, their hair is all messed up, so there's really no denying it and Jake simply says, I messed up. Oh my god, it's so bad that it's almost funny. Tiernan awkwardly goes up to her room and then the three of them proceed to argue over who deserves Tiernan the most. I know I fucked up. Noah says, and if I want her too, you don't want her. I shake my head, tossing the towel. You're latching on to anything that will hold you here. And you? You're not gonna marry her and keep her here, have babies and all that shit. She's leaving in the spring, going to college and moving on with her life. I might leave with her. I'm not sharing a woman with my two sons. How convenient, he spits back. After you took her away from us the other night, we had her first. No, you didn't. The night of the last race when you both were upstairs with who knows who. We were down here in the kitchen. I didn't go far, but something started that night. Caleb had already been on her out here the night when he came home from the cabin weeks ago, Noah retorts. Noah then goes on to confess that he actually likes Tiernan for more than just reasons, albeit very arbitrary ones. Well, I like her. There are times when I just want to be close to her. They eventually conclude this discussion with the agreement that Tiernan can make any decisions that she wants and whoever she chooses, they'll just have to roll with that. Jake then goes upstairs to check on her, quote, I just want to make sure she's all right. If she's crying, I'll fucking kill myself. No comment, but he goes up there, she's fine, and they end up having sex again. She wakes up the next morning and finds Jake in the bathroom staring at his My Mexico tattoo. Tiernan asks if he's thinking about her, as in Flora, and then there's this fake deep moment where Jake talks about how he's never told anybody about Flora before. I've never really talked about her, he says in almost a whisper to anyone but you. It's definitely interesting that this guy is using his barely legal niece to get over the grief of his girlfriend from 20 years ago. There's definitely a word for that. Uh, pathetic. There, it would be that one. And it's just so creepy. Like, they literally role play for a little bit that she is Flora, but then he's like, ugh, I could never pretend you were anyone other than you. But then goes on to say, you remind me so much of her. Like, ooh. This definitely should have been a psychological thriller where she manipulates Terrence and Cece into murdering all three of them. Please, I need to be somebody's ghostwriter stat. That? Are you kidding me? He finishes saying all of his fake romantic bullshit. She goes out into the hallway. She's holding her wet clothes in her hands. When she sees like a little cloud of smoke in the house, she's like, ooh, what's that? And in the darkness, in the shadows, mind you, there's Caleb just sitting there ominously, clearly having listened in on her having s his dad. And she just says, what? Caleb. And in response, he gets up and he corners her. She tries to move in the direction of her room, but he shoots out his arm and blocks her, which causes her wet clothes and underwear to fall to the floor, which Caleb immediately tries to grab the underwear and he starts rubbing it around in his hand. But when Tiernan snatches it back, it causes it to rip. And that pisses off Caleb so bad that he punches a hole in the wall right next to her head. He then pushes her into the room and shoves her down onto her bed and writes slut on her forehead in sharpie and then spits on her and leaves. But he made her a belt for her birthday so he's thoughtful and has redeeming qualities. <laughs> At breakfast, 
Tiernan and Noah get into a sexually charged tickle fight at the breakfast table. I, why did I read this? Oh my god. Noah starts singing. All play and no work makes me have a new toy. I don't know how the f he sang it okay i wasn't even gonna try to do a good job um this is just so cringe i'm actually revoking what i said earlier about penelope douglas secretly hiding that she might be a good writer but this tickle fight nonsense pisses off caleb i mean what doesn't right and he flings applesauce onto tiernan's face very charming stuff he then storms out of the house and we get yet another wonderful fake deep line from tiernan I'll never understand why it happened with Jake or why it could have happened with Noah. Something about this house, these people, lend credence every day to what I always knew I needed. Not s not a guy, just a place, somewhere or someone to feel like home. Oh my god, she said credence, she said the thing, she said the thing. Later that day, she unfortunately has another interaction with Caleb. This time it's in the barn. And here he's chopping up a deer with an axe. He's covered in blood. And when he sees Tiernan, he sticks his fingers in his mouth, um, eating the blood of the deer's blood. Um, I'm curious if people actually find this attractive or I'm just not straight enough to understand it. The next day, Noah shows Tiernan some old furniture that they have in their basement and she's super stoked about it. She's like, you know what? I'm gonna start a new hobby. I'm gonna refurbish some furniture. I'm gonna paint it. I'm gonna sand it down. It's gonna be cool. It's gonna be my new thing that I do. But out of nowhere, he kind of just starts like insulting her. Daddy didn't love you, so you're f mine so he'll love you like it's literally so incoherent and then he pivots to confessing his love for her i wanted to be there with you he whispers i was gonna make love to you i was gonna make love to you he's referring to the time that he tried to eat her out in front of his brother and also by the way i was gonna make love to you in front of my brother Fuck! This causes Tiernan to reconsider her life and be like, maybe Noah is the right guy for me. Maybe I've gotten it all wrong. And so they start making out, kissing. Uh, Noah gets his freaking wiener out and they almost have sex. He's like, let me into your bed tonight, Tiernan. He won't find out. He'll never know. And then she goes upstairs and actually has with Jake, leaving him alone in the garage with his peanuts in his hands. The following morning, Tiernan goes to the kitchen and she's working on some of these sketches of how she wants to refurbish different pieces of furniture and she's just minding her own business sketching when Caleb comes downstairs and she immediately is like, oh, like, what is he gonna do? Like, he's gonna do something, right? But he actually just stands there in silence so she starts talking to him and she explains how she hasn't done anything artistic like this since she was a kid because her parents were never proud of her so she just like gave up on doing anything like that and he comes up to her and actually hugs her and in her inner monologue she thinks to herself i feel safe how? The next day, Jake heads out on a four-day fishing trip up in their log cabin that they have a few miles away. The reason being that he wants to collect as many fish as possible before burping the, the the storm comes the snowmageddon happens which by the way for them saying you can't do shit in the snow they sure have been doing a lot of shit in the snow so jake leaves meanwhile tiernan starts doing her laundry and she's folding up her clothes when she realizes that a bunch of pairs of her underwear are missing and she's like omg who took these should i check caleb's room Caleb wouldn't have done this. Just another instance of a character forgetting what happened like five pages earlier. But she goes to his room and she's looking around. She's taken in her surroundings, right? And she's like, wow, he reads. He's so interesting and mysterious, actually. But then she looks under his bed and sees what might be evidence that he maybe is a serial killer. As I reach under the bed, I see something and stop. 
Three grooves are dug into the wood, and I reach out my hand, immediately fitting my forefinger, middle finger, and ring finger into the scratches. Something scratched the floorboard. Or... Someone. Da da da. And as if this wasn't crazy enough, Noah comes home drunk off of his rocks and starts making moves on her and also throwing shade at his dad. You needed affection from him, Noah says, referring to his father. He abused his authority with you. With me, you can play. With me, you can call the shots. I narrow my eyes at him confused. Is that what he thinks is happening between his father and me? A lost orphan who needs love? He really thinks Jake took advantage. Okay, the way that I hate Noah, but he's so right. Like a broken clock is right twice a day. Don't silence him. He's right. Not to sound like the elderly Gen Z that I am, but the way all three of them act entitled and accuse each other of predatory behavior when they're literally all predatory reminds me of like the three Spider-Men pointing at each other. But yeah, let me reiterate, Jake is not in the house at the moment. And later that night, Tiernan is experiencing night terrors. She's screaming in her sleep, she's wailing, and both boys wake up and go to her room to see what's going on. Without hesitation, Caleb gets in her bed and hugs her until she goes silent. Noah observes this and concludes that he's been doing doing this for a while now because he hasn't heard her scream and apparently she does this every night. But a sudden smoky stink interrupts this thought process because they look out the window and the barn is on fire. The two of them run outside and want to stop the fire at all costs, of course. Tiernan wakes up and follows closely behind. And despite Noah's protest, she runs up to the barn and tries to free the horses from their stables. But as she's untying one of these harnesses, this horse just fucking yeets itself out and pins her arm on a sharp nail that's like coming out of the wood and it's a pretty bleak injury like her arm is like sliced and there's blood like going and leaking all of this meanwhile caleb is trying to slash at their outdoor water tank so it like can put out the fire it's intense and the flames finally start receding after he wastes a lot of their water doing that but tiernan's arm is in such bad condition that they hurry her into the house and and know that they have to take action right now to prevent any sort of like infection from happening because at the moment apparently there's no way for them to get to a hospital. They end up pouring her multiple shots of tequila to try and numb the pain as Caleb haphazardly sews her wound closed and this is obviously very painful. She begs Caleb to stop because this is obviously very insane to do without painkillers and by like an amateur and so she starts pulling away and in response he slaps her in the face so hard that quote a tendon nearly snaps and she's of course like what the fuck why did you do that but Noah's just there all snide like well <laughs> you're not in pain anymore are you? I understand trying to distract from pain, but a huge slap across the face, like really? This feels like a Twitter incels fantasy. Like, oh, if a woman does this, can I slap her? I would do this if my bro was in pain. So she asked Caleb, um, why did you specifically choose to slap me in the face? And this actually becomes a perfect segue into asking him what the hell happened between him and Cece Diggins. She's like, why did she come out of the water with a bloody nose? And Noah's just like, ugh, that girl would do anything for attention. Caleb doesn't say anything or make any gestures in his defense, but of course, you know, Noah goes on trying to defend him. He doesn't 
hit women, Tiernan. Like, as if it was obvious or something. I mean, oh, so he, like, draws the line at that, but not, like, assault. He finishes sewing her up, but she's still concerned about there being an infection for obvious reasons. So she mumbles to herself, I wish Jake was here, which honestly makes sense as he is the biggest adult of the group, unfortunately. But this leads Noah to go on a very incel coded rant about how he doesn't understand why she wants Jake when it was them who saved her right now. You know, it just occurred to me, I'm actually the only man in this house who hasn't hit you and I'm the one you don't want. What the f- is wrong with you. For some reason, this is treated like a very valid response and something we need to be sympathetic to. So Tiernan walks over to him and hugs him and tries to cheer him up. Noah is always warm, I say. He's the one I love to talk to. He's the one who smiles at me and always makes me feel like my lungs are full. My arms fit around him perfectly. Like, girl, he does not deserve your attention at all. Also, I guess she's not love, like air quotes, love with her uncle anymore, and now the love interest has become her cousin. The two brothers draw her a bath in one of those big metal tin things. Like, you know those big tin things that they have at, like, Michael's that are filled with pine cones? Like, one of those. They put her in there, and they start aggressively washing her put with hand soap and a rag. Like, what in the unbalanced pH yeast infection is that? Don't piss me off. I don't play about pH. Noah then starts doing things under the water and Tiernan's like, we can't do this. It might change things. I might lose them. Like, girl, that this ship is so fucking sailed. It's so done. The ship is underneath the sea, like the Titanic, like the submarine full with the billionaires in it like it is dead and combusted and words truly cannot describe how ridiculous the following pages of this book are because outside of like a moral level outside of a literary level we have to ask ourselves do the words on this page make sense. Have we gone from point A to point B? Because Tiernan says stuff like, Caleb is a bully and a baby, but so am I. And I want him to talk to me, but sometimes I think he already does. And I just don't hear. The tight way his arm is around my waist, how safe I feel with his other hand cradling the crook of my neck, giving me his meat at dinner, taking me away from Cece and Terrence on the dance floor. He's always thinking about me. That's how he talks to me. Um, don't drag the mute community into this, please. What am I missing? Like, I, I've told you guys, I don't think I need to remind you what he's done so far in this video. Like, but how did we get to point B? Was there a point A? What did I, we, the audience, miss? This was not in the previous pages. I promise you that. But anyways, they end up having a threesome. Which I don't know how that works between biological brothers. I'm all for strangers' balls touching. But it just does not seem like a great thing to happen between siblings. As horrible as this is, I was honestly a bit relieved that Jake didn't come home and join in on this too. Like, I was actually very shocked when that didn't happen. I guess maybe Penelope Douglas's publicist was like, please, Penelope, please don't do that. And she was like, okay, uh, I guess one threesome is enough. The next day, when there's more clarity, they do end up wondering about silly, trivial questions questions such as, how did the barn fire start? Hmm. But then they go back to wondering about what should we do about this whole cousin situation? Caleb checks on her stitches and starts cleaning them for her. And she's like, I don't know what you were trying to tell me last night, but trust me, I felt it. You guys, I don't want to be too graphic, but like he did butt stuff with her last night with his brother. And I'm not exactly sure like what what deeper meaning you can try to get from that. Like, I truly do not think that there is one. But just as we're pondering the secret messages of
a surprise jake is back oh my god he's back from his fishing trip early and he's like what the hell happened here i left you guys alone for one night he sees tiernan is injured and quickly shoos the boys out of the room so he can inspect her for himself now this is when he gets the news that his two sons have now also been with her something happened last night I whisper. After the fire, I go on. With the boys. I don't blink, and neither does he as he avoids my gaze. My stomach turns. Both of them? He asks, looking down to pick up some gauze he dropped on the floor. I... Um, his lips tighten and he wraps my arm. Were they good to you? I, did you finish those college applications yet? He asks, cutting me off. He then helps her into the shower and stares at her longingly before eventually closing the curtain. And that is the end of that relationship. No updates from his pov or anything. Can't say I miss him, but it did seem important to the plot for it to just get cut off abruptly. But as he's walking out the door, he tells her, Hey, don't go outside by yourself tonight. And Tiernan's like, what? Why? The fire started in the loft. There's nothing there that could have caused it. I stare at him. So it wasn't an electrical or something the boys did? What? And then it hits me. The fire was set on purpose? I thought you said nobody could get up here. No. He shakes his head. I said the roads were closed. He leaves the room and I gape after him. Someone else could have been here last night? Da da da. Even from within the confines of this brain rot prison, nothing could have prepared me for Caleb becoming the main love interest of this book. Capital T H E. He is the one. They end up making out again. They have solo this time and even though he fully fully ignores her still and treats her like crap she's like i need this for the rest of my life <clears throat> the next day murai calls tiernan on the phone and she's like oh i have some horrible news for you you're not gonna like this one so the daily post kind of just put out this article about your parents and multiple sources are saying that your your father was abusing your mother and he forced her to die with him. And when I read this, I was like, oh my God, here it is. Here's why people like this book. Here is the good stuff. So we're about to find out that Tiernan didn't know this, but her mom loved and cared about her the whole time. Mama and Papa Tiernan were in an abusive relationship and she spent so much time away from her because she was just keeping her crazy ass husband away from her and her dad was the one who made the decision he was gonna try to send Tiernan away to creepy uncle Jake and that was the final straw for her to try to leave him but then he killed her and made it look like shit. Duh. Oh my god, dude. Fuck this book, but I love a good plot twist. I actually started getting excited. I started foaming at the mouth. I was like, oh my god, like 400 and something pages in and it wasn't a waste of time. Like, what? But alas, none of that happens. In fact, literally nothing happens in consequence to this. This is one of two times this gets brought up for the rest of the book, like in passing, and there is no further details revealed about her parents so everybody get up Woo! later that day she asks noah what will happen to all of them when she goes off to college and he's like well what if you don't leave what if we all get you pregnant instead <laughs> at this point i was like please please don't end this book i'm begging you don't end it with her being pregnant i will kill someone he 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 in response to this tiernan's inner monologue is i don't know what to say noah is who i should be with if anyone he's young kind attentive he talks to me i can grow with him he's good so why don't i tell him that i feel that being in this area has like subtracted uh 300 000 like 
aura from her like she has forgotten that other people exist outside of the Vanderberg house he's who I should be with what what have you seen every other person in the world lord please take away my pain and give it to the Vanderbergs I mean the only question you might be asking right now is how could it get worse could it get worse is it going to well yes Caleb locks her in her own room for several hours while well, she screams to get out um she finally falls asleep and that's when he enters the room and um he literally actually this time really whips her no words no words it was not a fun read um she runs away from her room into noah's and she doesn't want to explain what happened so she's just like sitting there forcing him to like not look at her he's like did he hurt you and she's just like no i don't want to talk about it and so with that being said with noah knowing that obviously caleb has done something bad to her he's like i think now is a good time to drop some of Caleb's lore on you actually I'm gonna tell you about his life a little bit all right so here's the freaking tea you freaking fuckers he was with our mom Noah tells me breaking the silence it was a rainy spring day and some guy she'd been running with on the side was with them they had gone to the store or so she told my dad instead they went off to a white house off on a dirt road somewhere and left Caleb in the car locked it and said she'd be back in a bit. He pauses and then continues. She went inside and the brief stop turned into a party. She got high, lost time, and fell asleep in the house. Caleb was alone in the car and no one around for miles to hear him call out or cry when the minutes turned into hours and the hours turned into days. There was no food in the car and the only water came from the leak in the roof when it rained. And at some point, his throat went raw from crying out out, Noah explains. But when my father found him, he wasn't crying or calling out. Not anymore. Just sitting in the seat in his own filth, staring off and barely even registering when the door was finally opened. How much time, I ask? How much time do you lose? It takes a moment for him to answer. Four days. I'm not and I won't ever try to discredit somebody's trauma. It is very sad that people actually stop talking because of traumatic experiences but I really just don't feel bad for this character like at this point nothing could make me feel bad for him um unfortunately this was enough to get Tiernan to get up and go back to her room and hug Caleb and tell him that she's sorry and mind you she's wearing one of Noah's shirts but only because he her and then she ran to his room for refuge but Caleb is staring at her shirt and she's like oh don't worry I didn't do anything with Noah I don't want to do anything with anyone except for you and they're hugging and then she realizes that he's holding half of a table leg in one of his hands like a furniture leg like one of the furniture pieces that she's been working so hard on and she's like what did you do and she runs outside to find all of her pieces burning outside the door. She rightfully then has a meltdown and starts smashing it all even more with a tire iron. Oh my god, why did I say it like that? Tire iron? Tire iron? Caleb taps his hand twice on his chest and then disappears into the night. A week passes and Caleb has still not come back. Um, Noah tries to tempt her into having sex with him, um, a various amount of times, but he's like, hey, do you love Caleb? Because if you do, um, feel free to leave me alone. But if you don't, hop in this shower with me right now, mamas. She can't answer the question though and therefore she is in love with this man and she's super worried that he's been out in the snow doing god knows what she misses him dearly and so she goes and explores his room come to find out that the books that she had seen in there a couple weeks ago when she was like wow he reads whoo 
he's mysterious this is sexy um it turns out those aren't like novels written by other people they're just books that he has written in so he's a very frequent writer she goes ahead and pries open the newest looking volume and reads some of the passages and one of them says i know you're scared of me and i know it's my fault cc trying to slap me in the cave that day because i didn't want her and instead falling into my shoulder and bloodying her own damn nose and ended up being the least of your worries. I did horrible things to you all on my own. I hate that I ever did anything to get you to love me. You'll never love me. I don't even know why Penelope Douglas felt the need to clarify that part about Cece Diggins in this section. I mean, even if we absolve him of the crime of punching Cece, there's still just too much on this guy's record to feel good about him at all. Furthermore, I think the only other really important one here is you scare me I scare you don't let me hurt you anymore why can't I stop hurting you just fuck them okay keep fucking them so I don't want you so damn much I'm a mess because wanting you feels good and I don't know what to do when things feel good everything is a mess and I'll make a mess out of all of it but I'm going to miss you I miss you oh my god uh 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 so sad. It's truly crazy how this book tries to justify so much of what Caleb has done, like so much. And it's truly undeniable by the end that that is what is happening. In the following chapter, Noah helps Tiernan go out on horseback to actually look for this guy. And um, they end up traveling to that log cabin that Jake had gone to to go fishing a couple days ago. They find him here. Uh, um, she kisses him and she says, I love you, Caleb. I love you. Let's not be friends. Let's fight and laugh and make babies someday and go insane because I'm f***ing in love with you. I don't ever want to let him go. Not in April when the snow stops. Not in August when school starts. Not ever. Noah is presently waiting for them outside while they talk it out, by the way. And they just end up having completely ignoring him out there in the snow. I mean, fuck him, honestly, but what? This has to be considered cousin-on-cousin -cousin crime because Noah is allegedly in love with her, listening to them have passionately like, I love you, I love you. So they come back to the Vanderberg house, right? And they spend the whole week together, side by side. She doesn't sleep in her own bed. They're just inseparable, right? And one day she realizes that Jake has been acting really weird and having mood swings lately. And so, you know, they have to have the talk, right? Like this whole situation is so weird. Ugh. So she approaches him and she goes, are you okay? And he's like, I'm fine. And she's like, I don't think you are and she's pretty sure that he's either feeling guilty concerned or possibly and most likely jealous she tells him that she's happy and in response he says just don't get pregnant you're only 18 and she's like i know i won't and he's like and you're going to college too by the way this same night noah makes the announcement that he's going to be leaving off to la in the spring and not only this but that he is going to be dragging Tiernan out there with him because he's like guess what when the novelty of this wears off you are gonna be so miserable here and I don't think you're ever gonna be happy with my brother like he's gonna make you miserable like you need to get out and he's honestly making so much sense to be honest and Tiernan is pissed off about this like you shouldn't be saying this about your brother but deep down she has her doubts she's like maybe I do want to go out and see the world maybe I don't want to speak spend my whole entire life here in this place that I barely know at age of 18. We do a little two month time skip and Tiernan and Caleb run into Cece Diggins and she is no other than pregnant. She's super, super pregnant. Like over six months pregnant, which is like around the time when her and Caleb were doing stuff. And Cece herself is like, let me guess. You're going through the math in your head right now? She smirks, looking between us. We'll be in touch, she whispers to Caleb. Tiernan, of course, is like, did you know she was pregnant? Is it yours? She keeps prodding him and prodding him and he's just 
just completely ignoring her, not giving her any sort of sign at all, like as a reaction. And she's, of course, like, Cece's gonna be in our lives forever, you know? She's gonna have his first child, not me. She tells him to get the fuck out of the car, and then he has to find his own way home. She heads back, giving up on getting any sort of answer from him, and she's like, let's just get this over with. Where's the photographer? And you're like, what? This is when we find out that she actually is doing like sexy modeling for the Vanderberg motocross page. And not only is she in a bikini doing sexy poses, she's doing sexy poses with Noah on the motorcycle in front of Caleb. And the photographers literally know that they're cousins. They literally say, not too close, their cousins. Like, what? You can't just freely be an incestual cousin in the public eye. Like, everybody knows this. Whatever happened to the thing where she was wanting to lay low and not be in the press and, like, do her own thing? You don't think that the press would love to find out that she does sexy photo shoots with her own cousin? This book goes on for another excruciating painful 50 pages for what? Who? Only God knows. But the conclusion is that Tiernan and Noah move to LA. Noah does his motocross. Tiernan goes to college. She finds out that this baby Cece was pregnant with was in fact not Caleb's. Um, I swear to God, okay, if any of you have read this book, please let me know who the fuck's baby this was. I tried to reread a lot of this and figure it out. I looked it up. Um, I could not figure out whose baby this was or if they ever even said it. Honestly, wouldn't surprise me if Pe Penelope Douglas just like forgot to say that. But Caleb ends up showing up at her house and he speaks to her. He says that he loves her and that he came over here. He finally left Colorado to be with her. And as many of you guys have probably already predicted at this point, Tiernan is pregnant. Yes, Lord. We love when the book ends with a woman barefoot and pregnant. Ooh. What can I say, y'all? I said I didn't want the book to end this way, and it did. But um, at least she wasn't pregnant at 18. She's pregnant at five years later. That's 23. Hello, math. Um, their baby's name is Griff. Ooh. That's a good one. And the whole fam is still around. The fam is here for this. Despite everyone's little nalgas touching each other, we are still out here. Booty butts, chones, and all. Wow. I'm so glad I spent this time with you guys. I'm not happy that I read this book at all. In fact, it took me so long to finish this. It's 3.03 a.m. Um, I just didn't want to do this. <laughs> I just didn't want to do it. But you know what? It ended up being fun. Thank you so much to my patrons. I love you very much and you are so wonderful. My next video is a Jeffree Star deep dive, so you already know this shit's gonna be long as hell. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I'll see you guys very, very soon. And don't do anything with your cousin, please.